Academy of Sciences. Delighted to. Uh, I'm Alex Rubenstein, President and CEO of the Academy, and, uh, and I'm especially delighted to have uh, another one of this. This is the fifth annual event that we have, uh, and it's the first time we get to have the actual marriage broker in the room, Mr. Meyer. I call him the marriage broker because he created the Bloomberg name on the Bloomberg School, which is the oldest and largest uh, public, uh, independent uh, graduate uh, uh, global health program in the world, and uh, so it's uh, thrilling to have them join us here in New York. We like to think that New York is the center of science, and uh, when we're all together, actually working together, as you know, uh, we have we can outscale every, every place in the world, but it doesn't mean that we have a lock on all the brilliant talent, and so one of the thrills for me has been the alliance that we've had with Mike Plagg, who I'm going to introduce, and Peter Agri and uh, Al Summers the entire Hopkins team, uh, because it basically proves a concept, which is we're not going to address these global challenges by ourselves. We need to come together and create multilateral partnerships. And this is a magnificent example of it, and we're thrilled to have them here. So to really run the show, I'm going to introduce the uh, spectacularly great dean of uh, the uh, Hopkins School, Mike, Dr. Michael Clyde. Thank you, Alice. I have to have you write my introductions from now on. Uh, you know, uh, under uh, Alice's leadership, the New York Academy of Sciences, I think, should change its name because you, you really have extended the borders far beyond New York, you know, across the U.S. and across the globe. And so it should be called the New York Plus Academy of Sciences. But we always feel so welcome and warm. You have a beautiful facility, great staff. And we, uh, every year I look forward to these conferences. And we have done a conference before. Uh, on malaria three years ago, and uh, that's when uh, that was when we announced that Peter was coming to direct the center. So, uh, and I'm glad that you have the shades drawn because the view from this uh, facility is so breathtaking. It's hard to talk with the shades open. So, so this is as as Ella said, the 10th anniversary uh, of the Malaria Research Institute, and to celebrate that, we prepared a short video that I'd like to show. And I think this video will give you some idea of the impact, the devastation that this disease causes but the passion, excitement, and, and creativity that scientists bring to, to, to attacking it. So please roll the video. I see it everywhere. I think about it all the time. I hear it. We see the world through the lens of malaria, because malaria is still ravaging the world. Each year, 10% of the planet gets malaria. One million people die. 85% of them are children under five. It's a 19th century disease, but it's still out of control in the 21st century. Malaria not only kills people, but it also strangles economies. Some people spend a quarter of their income on treatment. So malaria doesn't just prey on the poor, it perpetuates poverty. I've seen young people die of malaria with doctors standing there helplessly. I've had malaria. It, it feels like a slow motion nightmare. The biology of this disease is astounding. It's like these little parasites are outsmarting us. They're so adaptable. Can we use a simple bacterium to block the parasite? Can't we develop better drugs? Can we engineer a mosquito that can't transmit the disease? The life cycle of malaria is too complex for any single antidote, but we're finding promising new ways to attack it at its most vulnerable point. It drives us forward. It gives us hope. But while we work, 3,000 children die of malaria each day. That's like seven jumbo jets full of kids crashing every day. It's my happy duty to introduce uh, Mike Bloomberg, the mayor of New York, and as Ellis has pointed out, our school is named after him. It's not uncommon for schools to be named after benefactors or philanthropists, but in our case, 
our school is named not only after a benefactor, but a hero. He, he's a guy who has changed the world. He's data-driven, and his metric is the number of lives saved. And Mike, operating from this base as an elected official here, has just created a model that, by its power, has been replicated around the world. Take tobacco control and smoking. You know, the 30% reduction in New York, and now places that we never would have conceived of as being smoke-free or having a ban uh, have that because they see the power of the data that's been generated in New York. You know, he's taken that his largesse and put it to influencing nations around the world, to creating leaders who can take on this scourge. But you know, it's obviously not just tobacco. It's it's uh, obesity. Uh, it's uh, you know, it's in our case malaria. Uh, he he takes on big problems, and his metric is lives saved. You know, we come up. Uh, uh, our students come up and meet with Mike once a year, and I can remember one asked him one day, he said, you know, Mary Bloomberg, how, how have you been so successful in so many different spheres? You know, first, uh, you know, in business, now uh, as an elected official, and, and, and then in public health. And Mike's first advice was, it's simple. First, become a millionaire. <laughs> then a billionaire, and then the rest is easy. But it's not easy. Uh, you know, uh, I think for every one of our faculty who interact with Mike, we know that we have to bring numbers and data and that he asks questions. He's intellectually engaged in our work, but emotionally and passionately supportive. So I give you Mike Bloomberg, the mayor of New York City. Thank you. Um, while Ellis was talking, I was thinking there is a New York connection to the uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health. The School of Public Health was started by grants from the Rockefellers, New Yorker family, and I had dinner last week, I guess it was, and uh, with David Rockefeller, and we talked about it. He was always very proud that his ancestors were the first ones to create any schools of public health in the world, I think. Is that not probably true? Anyways, um, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, Dr. Clagg's leadership of the Bloomberg School of Public Health, just let me say this. What really makes him a great leader is that he has the rare gift of inspiring everyone, uh, from the newest student to the most senior researcher, and making each one feel that he or she is vital to the school and to its mission. And uh, for those of you who are here from Baltimore, from Zimbabwe, or from any point in between, uh, welcome to New York. Um, while you're here, let me... Uh, urge you to enjoy everything that New York has to offer. The diversity of our city is really quite amazing. You will find people that practice your religion, speak your language, understand your culture, eat your food, whether you're coming from Minneapolis or LA or any other place in the world. Uh, New York is the most diverse city in the world. We live together in a very unique way. But while you are here, I want you to do some uh, sightseeing. I want you to take in a show, but most importantly, I want you to spend lots of money. <laughs> we need the sales tax revenues. Um, anyways, wherever you're from, thanks for joining us to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Johns Hopkins Malaria Research Institute. Ten years ago, the Institute was nothing more than a glimmer in the eye of Dr. Clagg's predecessor as dean of the, Baltimore, of the Bloomberg School of Public Health, the ever-persuasive and ever-persistent Dr. Al Sommer. Uh, for any of you who have tried to say no to Al, forget about it. And Diane Griffin, its first director, who is also with us today, and now under the direction of Nobel laureate Peter Agre, from whom you'll hear more later. This institute really has become increasingly important uh, as a force in research for what we're calling the forever war against malaria. If you go back and look at bones from the Roman days, two things are clear. They all had lead poisoning, so Nero really was crazy, and they all had malaria, or a lot of them did. And when they drained the swamps in Rome, the malaria went away. The secret of the Panama Canal was they drained the swamps, and unfortunately just can't do that all over the world. Um, the Institute's work is ever-broadening. Uh, ten years ago it consisted of only two researchers, and since then the Institute has assembled the most gifted team of researchers dedicated to eliminating uh, eliminating malaria with 25 faculty members and approximately 200 young scientists and staff working very hard both in Baltimore and in Africa. And their work really does run the full gamut from the 
front lines of public health to the frontier of genomic engineering. Uh, ten years on, we're in no position, unfortunately, to declare victory over malaria. Uh, far from it. But in that past ten years, we've advanced towards that victory. And I said something to Peter before, why haven't you cured malaria? I hope you'll be out of work. And he says he would like to put himself out of work. But the only ways we'll let him get out of work is to get a victory over this disease that has just gone on forever and takes a million lives a year. Uh, we have a clear idea of where and how to concentrate our work. Uh, we've seen promising advantages in uh, advances in ranges of areas from uh, research into vaccines to countering the spread of drug-resistant malaria to uh, a program of highly effective surveillance and control of malaria in Zamba uh, Zambia. Uh, to the most uh, radical and, and exciting project of all, the effort to build a better mosquito, meaning one that is malaria resistant in the Institute's labs. Now the deadly impact uh, that malaria has around the world is the reason that I became so involved in this issue and why others, including uh, Bill and Melinda Gates, have made it a priority as well. And the Gates really have tried to uh, do everything they can and they should be congratulated on all of their largesse and all their work. Um, but even with the progress we've made over the past a few decades, uh, consider this. Over the next 12 months, up to 10% of the men, women, and children on Earth, especially the children on Earth, will contract malaria. Approximately 1 million people will die, most of them children. Many millions more of those who survive will face lives uh, marred by epilepsy, blindness, hearing loss, and often severe learning disabilities. Some 40% of the world's population is at risk for malaria, a percentage that is steeply higher in sub-Sahara Africa. Each year, malaria kills 5% of African children, an average of 3,000 children a day, as you saw in the film. And worldwide, the most common age of death from malaria is four years old. Just think about that. If it was your child, what would you do? You stand there totally helpless in many cases not understanding what's happening to your child, but just knowing in your society it happens all the time. That makes defeating malaria, I think, one of the consummate public health challenges in the world, a challenge that time and time again has defied our best efforts. In fact, the challenge of defeating malaria possesses an endless question, many of them uh, questions, many of them surprising ones. For example, who would believe that scientists have actually set out to create a new life-saving partnership with an insect that we'd all just as soon see dead. And I'm speaking, of course, of the mosquitoes themselves, and specifically the females of certain mal uh, malaria-carrying species who introduce the malaria parasite into human blood. Because one of the most promising avenues of malaria research, we think, involves genetically engineering a mosquito that can resist and kill the parasite itself short-circuiting its life cycle before it reaches us. And if we could do that, would make an enormous that would be an enormous achievement. Uh, and it's one that institute scientists are making exciting headway on. Not there yet, but there is lots of glimmers of hope, lots of reasons to keep pressing on. And one of the institute's gifted research teams has now also modified the mosquito in ways that would dramatically interfere with its ability to transmit malaria from one individual to another. Other teams are working on other modifications that are also promising, and testing is, uh, testing is now underway uh, to determine if such modifications could be a viable, environmentally sustainable way to attack malaria. Now, there's still a long ways to go before we get there. Every day I pick up the newspaper, and when I read a story about malaria, I quickly look down to see whether uh, the school is mentioned or the project is mentioned, and if it's not, I'm really annoyed. Um, <laughs> Uh, but it also, uh, no matter how many times you read exciting things, uh, progress being made, yes, there is progress being made, but to say that we're anywhere near where you have to be is just ridiculous. We are not. We still have a very long ways to, get, to go to get there. Uh, but there's no doubt that this institute is making groundbreaking and incredibly encouraging progress. Now, the work of the Malaria Research Institute is designed to attack the disease along the broadest possible fronts. It marries lab research and public health outreach, as you would expect from a school of public health, uh, not because the, that approach is easy, because it's hard, and also because it happens to be the only one we think with any hope of success. And while the Institute is now 10 years old, in many ways its work 
is still in its early stages because the, like the Comprehensive Tobacco Control Program and the Healthy Diet Initiatives that we've launched here in New York City, and like the global initiatives that Bloomberg Philanthropies is actually supporting to discourage smoking, increase traffic safety in the world's developing nations, and expand sustainable environmental policies in a wide range of cities. Uh, the work that the Institute is designed to do uh, to meet the simple objective of the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, promoting and saving lives millions at a time. And that's been a slogan of the school for uh, time. Did you create that? Did it really? Is that, I can take some credit for this? Oh, well, that'd be good. Um, anybody you tweet me or something. Um, all kidding aside, I can't think of a more important or rewarding mission. Uh, all of us, so I've always joked about this when uh, somebody wins, a, a, he's got to win the second Nobel Prize. I keep telling you, you can do it. Uh, when, when Peter or Van win a Nobel Prize, uh, you, me, everybody that contributed, those of us who worked with them, those of us who supported them, uh, those of us who wrote checks or wrote articles or something, we're all an um, integral part of the process. And uh, if you want to look in the mirror and say, I made a difference, uh, curing malaria would certainly put a smile on your face. And there are lots of other things you can do as well. So uh, let me uh, wish uh, Peter and Michael and the colleagues a uh, happy anniversary. And thank you for everything that you have done, Michael. Uh, have a great symposium. Uh, I've got to go face the rain, which is dampening the protesters today, so I can have time to come. <laughs> What's going to happen tomorrow? I have absolutely no idea, but uh, this too will pass. The only, and the thing that we have to make sure that passes is malaria. God bless and thank you, everyone.